Eye panel, starring Young John, Mia, and Tassim. How are you ladies doing today? Woo! Sounds like a game show. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Well, I wanted to bring you guys in and have you talk to each other a little bit, and to me, of course, off camera, because I, I feel like I don't want to be the one that's fully administering what the content is during AAPI Month. I want to hear straight from you guys about why you're a part of this campaign and what excites you about uh, kind of left politics. So, you know, I don't, let's start with Tassine. Like, why, why Bernie? Why are you here? Honestly... I was never really that into politics, so for me this is very new, but Bernie has always been the only politician that's kind of been on the right side of left things, um, but he's always been on the side of justice, and I feel like even as um, a presidential candidate, he's he cares more about the people than the presidency itself. Like, he's always just fighting for the people, and, you know, that, that means a lot to me. Mia, yeah, what about you? Um, I think I, I decided to work for Bernie because the values that I embody are all of the things that he fights for because he acknowledges this concept that a person can be like a braided person, that Americanness is, you know, a flow of a lot of intersections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm John? Um, well, it starts with my parents. Mm. So I always thought I'd become a doctor because my parents didn't have health care for most of their life. And, um, you know, Bernie is fighting for health care for everyone and staunchly Medicare for all. And I think that separates him from the rest of the pack. And if Bernie is elected, then my parents' life will be better. Do you guys have conversations with your parents and, or other family members about Bernie? Yeah, definitely. But the thing is, since my parents are immigrants, they really don't understand um, who Bernie is and what he stands for. They they love him, and they love him probably the most out of all the other candidates. But at the same time, they're I think that immigrant parents they're kind of jaded. They they always think that you know what we we want we have hope, but we're not really sure if what we want will ever be represented. Will, will ever actually come true. I see a lot of nods. Yeah, I mean, yes. Um, I also think that my parents are really excited that I'm working on the campaign. And so they have a restaurant in Brooklyn Heights. So they're like, get me a Bernie poster. I want to put it up on the restaurant, <laughs> um, which I think is so cute because they aren't really involved in politics that much. So I think there's a responsibility for especially um, second generation Asian Americans, second generation immigrants, to talk to their parents about why they're super excited about Bernie. And I think if we actually have real conversations about why our life will be better, why why their life will be better, then they're gonna be super excited about it too. Um, and they are connected to a network that we aren't connected to. So um, I really encourage all of us to have those conversations because our parents trust us. Do you have a sense of what kind of the best, most effective pitch is? Like, have you tried talking to them? Do you, do you have a sense of what kind of lands rhetorically when you're speaking to your parents versus what don't feel to be as big priorities? I think with my family, as the, you know, result of chain migration, you know, and chain, sorry, family-based mm -hmm. immigration, uh, that really resonates with them, understanding that not everybody enjoyed the, uh, let, me, let me backtrack. So... As the product of like family-based immigration, I think my parents really are understanding through what they see in the news that the experience we had coming to the U.S. is, at this moment in time, um, very lucky, right? Um, my mother, as a nurse, also was a part of many unions uh, when I was growing up, and I understood that to be a big risk for her, right? And so when Bernie invokes that language, they understand, whereas, um, you know, maybe in the past, as they were getting older and growing up with me in America, politics, uh, they were not awakened to it until really I was, because I was the thing that was rooted here, and then developed those values. So, one of the statistics that uh, we learned in another interview on this on this program, 
was that one out of every six undocumented immigrants in America is actually of Asian descent. Um, which is something that I didn't really realize, not the picture of immigration that we get. And I wonder, um, you know, with all of Trump's, you know, nativist, racist lingo, obviously, you know, how much is immigration an issue for you guys and also when you're in conversations with your family and, like, broader communities? Before you answer that, Chris, would you mind telling them to make a little less noise? Thank you. I understand the struggle now. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard because it's like literally like the social convening space immediately outside. Yeah. Yeah. And also the door. And the door. <laughs> it comes, I feel like, oh, thank under. You so much. I'm going to send a message. Mm. Oh, I didn't put my phone in. You're right. We need one of those door cotton stopper things mm. under the door. We'll mm. move this to the other studio. Oh. So. Immigration, how much is it an issue for you guys? I think it's a huge issue because um, my parents, my my family back in Bangladesh, like my my parents' family, um, they're still stuck there, and I think they've been in the system for over a decade, almost I think maybe almost two decades, and we it's crazy because I think they got one letter about four years ago saying, hey you might be considered to, to um, be able to immigrate into the U.S. And they're holding on to that letter still to this day. And I'm like, mm, I don't think you're coming anymore. Like, it's not happening. And honestly, they, they need to start looking into other options. But um, the fact that it takes two, like, decades or, like, 12 years to get into the States, that's crazy. Like, there needs to be some kind of, I don't know, change. Yeah, and on the undocumented issue in particular, I think it's – definitely a challenge that is really unseen outside of our communities, but it's very present and it exists. Um, and yeah, I, I think this is connected to the broader issue about how the Asian American constituency is really diverse, but this is one thing that really binds us together. And um, it also is a way where we can come together to fight Trump's xenophobia um, and also fight for a country where all of us belong to. So, you know, the Asian American constituency has so many languages. We have so many ethnic backgrounds. We have uh, different religions. It's really h hard for us to have and create a shared identity, but we do have a lot of similar struggles from immigration to healthcare to language barriers. Um, and like we all want to create a place where we feel like we can belong. And I think that those are some things that uh, bring us together. What do you guys make, given the diversity of the Asian American community, given the en enormous size and breadth and diversity of a Asia as a continent, what do you guys make of AI AAPI month? Because sometimes I feel, um, I feel often as a black American that there are, are times when we just kind of like create the version, like we reason from like the black version of things and make like like you know versions in, in other for other groups and there isn't always a direct translation it doesn't always come across the same way and I've experienced having to kind of like rustle up my Asian American colleagues at my law firm etc to be like okay what are we gonna do for APA month and they're like I don't know like whatever the white people want to do <laughs> right so I mean, I mean what do you make of this I think that's true I think that sometimes we ourselves don't get hyped up about our own months or whatever. I don't think we even created this. I don't even know who created this month because <laughs> I didn't know it was this month. But at the same time, it's kind of like we do need to rally together and kind of, um, you know, be part of these conversations. But I also kind of feel like AAPI month is, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm different. Like within the South Asian community, we don't really talk about it that much. Like I feel like... It's very East Asian or Southeast Asian, and they're having these conversations. And I think there's even a disconnect between um, like East East Asians and Southeast Asians. Like we're kind of the same, but we're really not at all. I don't know, not at all, but you know what I mean. <laughs> right. And even if you think of like the through lines that might connect sort of all of our experiences, it's I, whenever there's another month for another like ethnic group or minority or what have you. It's always a reminder of the extent of imperialism in this world 
and how all of that has shaped the trajectories of our families and where we come from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, America as the the net catch for a lot of that is, I think it's really important to acknowledge, you know, even if there are, I remember in college, right, I didn't feel it was completely represented by the Asian Students Alliance, so I made a Southeast Asian Students Alliance, but we'd I still party that. together, right? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's important to create the spaces and create um, those those dialogues that you have with each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if it takes a month to do that, you know, okay. I totally agree. And I also think, sorry, um, but I also think that, you know, in America, us, I mean, like, I'm talking more on East Asian because we don't really talk about how much of an impact Asians have had on mm -hmm. America itself. Like, um, I know that in order, I think the Chinese were in, immigrated into the U.S. I f don't remember the date, but they immigrated into the U.S. and they helped build these trains and helped build so much of what America is today. And yet, nobody talks about that. You know? Totally. We're part of America too. Yeah, I mean, a, a topic that came up in a different interview for this episode uh, was the um, Chinese Exclusion Act of 1924 and how it only was lifted sometime in mid-century, I forget the exact date, um, and that this is all very recent history. And so you have a group of Chinese Americans who have been here longer than a lot of other immigrant groups because there was this gap period during which there was no immigration, right? So everybody before a certain date has been here a real long time. <laughs> and then obviously there's more recent swings. Um, to that end, though, when you're talking about the impact of um, Asian Americans on America, it's been a big year. <laughs> There's been a lot uh, happening recently in the media. This is the year of Crazy Rich Asians. Ali Wong's been doing her thing, her second comedy special. Fresh Off the Boat's been killing the charts for a long time. I mean, do you guys feel like there's a, a sea change of, of, of sorts? Oh. <laughs> There's <laughs> silence. <laughs> Definitely, um, my I feel like in music, right? There's a lot oh of God. I mean, Filipino Filipino yeah. artists are killing it right now. Um, uh, even even in sort of the microcosm of like food culture, there's a real noticeable upswell of Filipino food hitting the mainstream. I mean, we live in D.C. where bad saying is shout out to Tom, but <laughs> you know, it's you feel like finally the generation that saw uh, difference and growing up, um, you know, in spaces where they might have been the only one that looked like them, were finally in our niches and finally, like, allowing that to permeate the mainstream. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I don't know. I kind of have an unpopular opinion about <laughs> Let's that. hear it! Let's hear it! <laughs> <laughs> So, I love seeing an all Asian cast on Crazy Rich Asians. I think it's amazing and think it's awesome. But I'm kind of sad that the film that made 2018 and now breakout year for Asian Americans is about a woman whose boyfriend is a crazy rich person. <laughs> that is kind of boring and I I think my, the hopeful take is like maybe this is an opportunity for us to show more realistic experiences of Asian Americans in media and there are some incredible artists who are creating really funny content like Ali Wong and Aquafina, killing it, love it, Jenny Yang, love it, um, but Crazy Rich Asians was just fine for me. You know, I will say, so when, um, what you know that show with Priyanka Chopra came out? Um, oh, I forgot gosh. what it's called, oh, that show. Oh, Sex and O? No. It's, it's oh, what's it called? Quantico? Qu Quantico, Quantico. Yes, yes, Quantico. So when Quantico came out, um, I was like, oh, like another, sh like a dumb show with a brown girl, like doing dumb things, like great, like it's going to be one of those chick flicks, right? But someone, Sean Mara, someone told me something really insightful. They said, this is probably kind of um, having chick flicks and like very, you know, shows that are just based 
on this like light storyline, um, they tend to be done only by white people, right? So this is the first time that like people of color are being put in these roles where it's like more of a fantasy, more of a romance, more of like a drama kind of a thing, right? Like how many brown people are in Game of Thrones, man? Like I know that's random. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's. I wrote my undergraduate thesis on Orange is the New Black because Ooh. I think I I totally empathize with Young Jung because it was the first time that we got to see like a Bechdel passing show where the majority cast was either representing queer women, were queer themselves, were brown, uh, but it was entirely encapsulated inside of a prison. It's like is the only time that we're going to see these interactions between females inside of a space that is completely outside of society, like othered. Yeah, yeah. All right, so mixed bag on the pop culture front. <laughs> yeah, and I empathize with a lot of this for obvious reasons. The, you know, do you celebrate a show because it's a finally a show where it's about someone incidentally being black and their blackness is relevant to their role, but not, it's not about tragedy or particularly about ethnic difference and those kinds of things. Yeah, that's a kind of a when, even if it sometimes defaults to being something very superficial and just about eye candy. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, they didn't have a lot of eye candy. <laughs> uh, so I want to ask you guys, just to wrap up, you know, if there is any kind of pitch you would give um, to any Asian Americans who might be thinking about um, Bernie Sanders, you know, what are the aspects of the campaign that you feel like are the most, um, you know, gripping to you? What are the biggest draws and what makes Bernie the best case, particularly since this election cycle has a larger number of Asian Americans running um, than ever before. Education. I think that education is so important in our communities, and Bernie probably has the most progressive policies on education. He's not only helping um, low-income African American and Latino communities, but he's helping our communities too. And the thing is, I think, as Asian Americans, we also have to remember to um, be more inclusive of other low-income communities. I think that we need to do a better job at that. We kind of isolate ourselves. Um, but I think that education is so important, and to be part of a campaign or to, to vote for someone who, you know, is voting for your kids. For me, definitely on the, uh, you know, if you care about Everybody knows someone in our communities who is trying to, you know, the phrase is like bring someone over, right? Um, trying to create that network for them to enjoy the benefits of living in this country. And I think what you'll find, and my pitch to them would be, is Bernie is hyper aware of the importance of that in creating the American fabric that we all want to see. Um, and additionally, of course, the his stance on labor and making sure that workers are treated fairly, that's really important for any one coming into this country without without a network, you know, if they're most likely going to be working in jobs that uh, they're most likely going to be working jobs that either are paying, you know, maybe minimum wage if they don't have the, you know, language background or the educational background that's required to have a, you know, a more elite paying job. So that would be my pitch. Mm. Um, so I'll start with Trump. So Trump and the Republican Party use racism and bigotry and xenophobia as a way to divide working people um, for us to come together and uh, you know, fight against the billionaire class. And I think Bernie um, talks about that and how much is at stake when that happens because that impacts our families and that impacts our lives and our livelihoods. So my pitch is that Bernie is the working class champion, and if we want to make our lives better, and our children's lives better, and our parents' lives better, Bernie is the candidate to do that. It's a perfect note to end on. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank this you. was really great. Thank you so much. Yeah.